So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, Homer Mueller, who is uh, from Berkeley. Um, I first met him when I was a rotator at NSF. He was, had applied for a career award. And I'm happy to say that I actually uh, awarded that award, and it was uh, very useful. Um, and so he comes from Germany. He got his degrees in Germany. And then he was a, uh, a, a, um, a Humboldt fellow and went to Stanford and worked with Steve Chu. Uh, and he told me this morning that that was a time when Steve was at, uh, at Berkeley Lab. And so he never saw Steve. So I don't know if that's good or bad. But uh, anyway, he's going to talk to us. He's an expert in, in, in atom interferometry. And so he's going to talk to us today about minute, not minute, minute scale interference in atom interferometry. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and for the wonderful opportunity to speak here. So um, they told me that this virtual laser pointer which is not laser pointing. Um, push the top button. There. there go. <laughs> um, the way it actually works, they just told me it contains a small accelerometer. And so it's not lasing, right? I can point it at you. Um, and it senses when I rotate it. I think that's quite fascinating because one of the applications of atom interferometry is inertial navigation, where you would take a device like this, just more sophisticated, and have it measure your acceleration and your rotation. And then from the initial conditions of your motion and the measured acceleration and rotation, you can calculate your position, something that the sailors used to call dead reckoning in the pre um, technological age, right? Um, okay, I'm going to talk about atom interferometry and how we were able to obtain interferences after splitting an atom so that it's in a superposition of being in two places, the usual quantum stuff, holding it for a minute and putting it back together and still see interference fringes. Um, this is part of the larger quest of the quantum community to keep the quantum state alive, right? If I, if I am very general, I want to do quantum sensing. Other people want to do quantum information processing. It's always about generating a non-classical state, trying to make it do something useful, and measure before interference from the outside world will scramble the quantum state so that your quantum operation is no longer feasible, right? OK, um, let's see. So interferometry is a familiar concept. Um, the largest, probably, interferometers are the LIGO gravitational wave detectors, where you take a laser source, you split it onto two arms, and then when the photons from the two arms come back together, they will either be in phase, in which case the electric fields add, generating a large probability of detecting photons at the atom, at the detector, or they can be out of phase so that the electric fields subtract, generating a small probability. The key why atom and why interferometers are so interesting is that it takes half a wavelength of path length difference to change constructive interference into destructive interference. So half a wavelength change in the arm length of this interferometer generates a 100% change in the detected intensity. But now they make the arms very long. They are four kilometers long. And by putting mirrors there, you can get the photons to traverse the arms about 100 times. So in fact, you have 400 kilometer arm length. So one micron change out of roughly a thousand kilometer arm length gives you a hundred percent change in the detected intensity. In other words, you're converting hundred kilometer over one micron is 10 to five. You're converting 0.01 part per trillion, if I get this right, into 100%. So that gives you an enormous lever arm to detect small 
changes, and in the LIGO case, the small change is an arm length change generated by a traversing gravitational wave. In atom interferometry, we are turning things around instead of using matter, such as mirrors and beam splitters, to manipulate light, we're using light to manipulate atoms. An atom is prepared, for example, in a magneto-optical trap and other cooling methods so that it's in a vacuum chamber and you slow down its thermal motion to a centimeter per second or so. You can even toss it up in the vacuum chamber so that it's in free fall. And depending on how tall you build this, you can have it in free fall for a second or two. And while it's on the way up, you fire a laser beam at it. Okay, so the laser beam can bring the atom into an excited state. And it also transmits its momentum of h bar k to the atom. If the process happens, the atom has just received a kick that will send it upwards, and it will go onto the higher trajectory indicated on the slide. If the process doesn't happen, it will keep going on its slightly lower trajectory. And by tuning the laser intensity and pulse duration right, you can get the process to happen with a 50% probability, creating an equal superposition of the atom being in the upper interferometer arm or in the lower interferometer arm. This is an oversimplified picture. These atoms are cesium atoms in our experiment. Other people use rubidium, but they also use strontium sometimes. And at least in cesium, the excited state will decay within a few nanoseconds, emitting a photon into a random direction. And by detecting that photon, you can, in principle, tell which way the atom takes. And that gets us back to the undergrad Young's double slit experiment. If I was able to tell which way my photon or electron took in that experiment, then the interference fringes will cease to be. So, we can't afford spontaneous emission in these experiments. They will decohere the quantum state. So what we do instead is we send in two laser beams. The first one stimulates the atom to go into an excited state, kicking it up in the process. The second one comes in from the top, stimulates the atom immediately to emit a photon downwards, kicking it up a second time. And now the atom is back in the ground state which doesn't decay. And that's a first measure to keep the quantum state alive in this experiment. Okay, after a whole, after time of flight big T, we fire the laser again, this time to kick the upper arm down and the lower arm up so that they meet again after another waiting time T and then they interfere. And if they do that, they gen if we do the experiment with, let's say, a million atoms, we generate the two output populations of the interferometer. And the relative population in the outputs A and B is a function of the phase difference accumulated between the matter wave packets along the path. This phase difference can be calculated by standard methods. Um, it consists of a free evolution phase that the atoms acquire while they're in flight between the beam splitting pulses and a phase they register when they interact with the laser beam. So whenever um, an atom absorbs a photon, the phase of the photon gets added to the meta wave. Okay, so all this is old stuff. Um, um, three people in the 90s did that. I think Fritz Riele in Germany, Jürgen Blüneck, in who was at ETH at the time, and Steve Chu and Markasevich at Stanford. Um, and by now it has plenty applications. Um, one of them is measuring the Newtonian gravitational constant. So how does that work? Well, the phase acquired by the matter wave packets as they are flying is an integral um, of the Lagrangian along the path, which includes kinetic energy and potential energy, such as the potential energy generated by gravity from these relatively large arrays of tungsten masses. And they can move these masses around and see the change in the interference fringes that causes and thereby determine the Newtonian constant of gravity. 
this has reached, I believe, about 10 to the negative 4 accuracy, which for precision measurements doesn't sound all too impressive. And it is not the most precise measurement of the Newtonian constant of gravity. That has been done by torsion balances. Okay. Um, but it has also to be said that it introduces a new method to the field of measuring big G, and that is important as a cross-check for systematic effects, right? For all we know, the systematic effects in this measurement could be different from those of a torsion balance. Okay. Can be used to measure the fine structure constant. How does that work? Well, now the kinetic energy of the atom comes into play. It also enters the Lagrangian and therefore enters the phase. We are now measuring the kinetic energy that the atom gets from being kicked by the photon. The photon momentum is h bar k. So that kinetic energy is h bar k squared over 2m. In other words, is a measurement of the combination h over m, the ratio of the Planck constant to the mass of an atom. This is how I would have to describe it a couple of years ago, but now the international system of units has been um, modernized, as Bill Phillips knows very well. The Planck constant is now a defined quantity, just like the speed of light used to be for a long time. So it's now fair to call this measurement a measurement of the mass of the cesium atom. What's so fancy about it? Can't I just use a mass spectrometer to do it? I can't because if I use a mass spectrometer, I get the mass in atomic mass units. But how much is an atomic mass unit in kilograms? Okay, that comes out of experiments like this. Knowing the cesium mass in kilograms, I can combine it with the Rydberg constant, which is also known in SI units and not in atomic mass units, right? And then use the fact that the Rydberg constant is proportional to one half alpha squared, where alpha is the fine structure constant. So this is one of the most accurate ways of measuring the fine structure constant. In fact, it has reached an accuracy below the 0.1 part per billion level. Other ways to measure the fine structure constant um, consist of measuring the gyromagnetic anomaly of the electron, the famous number G minus two, right? And um, by comparing the two methods, I can get a comprehensive test of the standard model because the standard model calculation of G minus two um, contains about 10,000 Feynman diagrams at the current level of accuracy. And so a lot of stuff has to be right in order for that comparison to check out. Finally, um, people have started breaking records in terms of how far can I separate the two wave packets in an atom interferometer and still get measurable interference. Notably at Stanford, they have brought the separation to half a meter. So that is a verification of quantum mechanics. Also want to highlight mobile applications, and that gets us closer to this um, inertial sensor in the virtual laser pointer. So here we put an atom interferometer in a U-Haul truck and drove it around the Berkeley Hills measuring how gravity goes down as you drive up. And we used that data together with a geophysicist at the US Geological Survey to determine the average density of the rock in those hills. And in the process, Actually, when this machine was sitting in a lab, we happened to pick up a couple of earthquakes, one in South America and one in Asia that happened at the same time. That gives you a sense of how sensitive these machines are. This was in 2019. Nowadays, there is a large and thriving quantum industry. For example, a company named Vector Atomics has just presented I think even a six axis sensor measuring three axes of um, acceleration and three of rotation at Photonics West. What limits these things? Well, one limitation definitely is the fact that the atoms are in free fall. I can't keep my quantum state alive if I throw it to the ground, right? 
And so to overcome that, people have gone to literally great lengths. The Stanford fountain in which half a meter separation has been achieved is 10 meters tall. And you can keep the quantum state alive in here for two or three seconds. And that's limited by how high it's built. At University of Bremen in Germany, they have dropped the entire machine down a drop tower, 100 meter tall. Um, but the coherence time was less than one second. It was not limited by the four and a half second time of flight. It was just limited by thermal atoms hitting the wall, by vacuum pressure, and lots of technical things. Similar with um, zero G flights that have been undertaken by Bouillet's Landrigens group in France. Also, the limitation here is no longer the time of flight, but the um, thermal atom motion and vibrations. And there is now a cold atom lab on the International Space Station that um, has very long free fall times, indefinite, so long as they keep the uh, managed station keeping of the space station right. But the interference time here is again limited to the below one second by those technical issues. I should say that the cold atom lab was started in a room right here at University of Maryland about 10 years ago. And um, you can say a lot of things about the cold atom lab, but one thing that I really like about it is NASA is apparently still able to turn an idea into a project in less than 10 years, which I think is awesome. OK, now we want to exceed these coherence times. So why do we want that? And I stole this not very complicated slide from Jake Taylor when we were all in the pandemic. I didn't want to go to online demo because I had seen too many Zoom meetings. But I was chairing a session in which Jake Taylor gave a talk. And he said, look, it takes about 15 minutes for gravity to become the dominant force in a system. Um, to give you an intuition for that, if I drill a tunnel through the Earth's core to the other side and I drop a ball into it, if the Earth was a homogeneous sphere, my ball would describe harmonic oscillations with a period given by this, one over square root the gravitational constant and the density of the Earth which evaluates to about 15 minutes. And for, of course, there's some numerical geometry factors in there, but this is it, right? In other words, if I want to conduct an experiment in which gravity is the dominant influence and not anything else, I have to work on a 15 minute time scale. Okay. Um, I don't wanna, say too many things that I don't know everything about, but I want to make the argument if even classical gravity is not the dominant influence in my experiment, how can I expect to be sensitive to quantum gravity? So let me argue that this also sets a minimum time scale on which signals from quantum gravity um, can be expected to be noticeable. And the operative word here is minimum. Right? Maybe it takes much longer. But if even classical gravity is not dominant, how can I expect to see quantum effects? OK, and so we said we need a radically new way to achieve more than a few seconds coherence time. Because if you just build taller, you reach a point of diminishing returns. Right? If um, 10 meters is if you want to double the time from a 10 meter setup, so you want to go from two and a half seconds to five, you have to build it 40 meters tall. For the next factor of two, you have to build 160 meters and so on, right? So, and there was an idea out there originally proposed by Claude in the, um, I think about 20 years ago, who said, why don't you run your usual beam splitter pulses and when you've generated a superposition of the two um, of the quantum states, turn on an optical lattice to keep your quantum state from falling. And then when you've waited long enough, you turn off the lattice and you run a sequence to put the two quantum states back together. 
That sounds very simple, but there's a reason why people didn't do that before. The reason is I need to isolate my quantum states from the environment to prevent unwanted decoherence. And the best way to do that is to have no interaction at all with it, meaning drop it. Here, the lattice laser is on. If the optical lattice is even slightly inhomogeneous, right? Meaning, let's say the potential contains some wiggles from speckled patterns that you have in a real laser beam, right? Then detecting the scattered photons gives me a way to tell where the atom is and the interference fringes stop, right? And so when they first did that, they got about 0.3 seconds of hold time and they could still see fringes later. The Tino group improved that to about one second. And that used to be the record for a long time. Um, in my group, we like putting optical cavities around everything. And optical cavities have one nice feature, which is mode filtering. Right now, the laser beam has to obey the boundary conditions at the mirrors. And if you do it right, it turns out it supports only one spatial mode at a certain frequency. And hopefully that gives you an extremely nice Gaussian beam, which comes close to what you write on a blackboard in an um, optics lecture. And that would give this more predictable properties and hopefully enable us to see longer coherence times. The apparatus looks like this. So the cavity mirrors so there's a vacuum chamber, it's magnetically shielded. There's a camera for detecting the quantum states. Mod beams come in from the outside. Um, the cavity mirrors have to be in the vacuum because if you send your nice mode filtered beam through vacuum viewports, you spoil its good properties. But then we were nervous that the mirror mounts for the cavity mirrors need to be adjustable and there needs to be a piezo to keep the cavity frequency stabilized for resonance with the laser. So the vacuum chamber consists of three parts. Um, the mirrors sit in their own chamber, and then there is a differential pumping tube to the main vacuum chamber. So even if the mechanics in here causes outgassing, spoiling the vacuum, that can be pumped out by a local pump and doesn't spoil the vacuum in the main experiment chamber. Because one thing that's gonna be important later, if I keep my quantum state alive for tens of seconds, then there's a huge chance that the atoms will along the way be scattered out by collision with background atoms. So the vacuum here needs to be exceptionally good. The setup, yeah. I'm, I'm missing something here. Okay. You, you said that you, you uh, wanted to have um, a uniform potential uh, uh, because otherwise looking at spontaneous emissions would tell you where you were, that's bad. But it seems to me spontaneous emissions are bad no matter what. Yes. It seems to me what you want to do is what you said for sure, you want to have, have a very clean mode, but you want to avoid spontaneous emission yeah. entirely, even if your mode is perfectly good. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, yeah. I was using a confusing example. Right? I'm sorry about that. And feel free to interrupt me with any and all questions. Worst thing that can happen is that I don't know the answer, right? Okay. So how good okay. does the vacuum have to be? It sounds like you want better than 10 minus 12. We can't get that, unfortunately. No, um, put it in liquid helium. Yeah, we don't. Tough. We don't have that facility <laughs> right now. <laughs> the 10 minus 11 is probably going to give you 100 seconds or more. Yeah, we don't even have that. So I want to say our vacuum is better than 10 to minus 10, but not much. And so the population decays with a time constant of about 14 seconds, which means, and um, this gives me an opportunity to. <laughs> um, point out one thing that I was going to say later. There are two important time scales in, the, in this experiment. One is the time in which the population decays, and one is the time during which the coherence decays, and they're independent. For example, improving the vacuum will mean that I have more atoms left over, but 
not necessarily that I have better coherence. We also tried making things worse, and there are things I can do that kick the atoms out, but they are still coherent. And that was very puzzling for us for a long time. All right, um, let me show you. And so um, this is Vicky Shu, who started this experiment as a grad student long ago. Um, about 10 to 6 cesium atoms, the cavity length is about 40 centimeters. The beam waste is 0.76 millimeters. We would have loved to make it larger, but then you need to make the mirrors flatter and the cavity becomes degenerate. So the cavity is already very close to unstable. It's unfortunately hard to make the beam waste much larger. The finesse is only 130. Why didn't you guys use a better finesse? Because in order to manipulate the atoms, we have to send in laser beams of different frequencies, and we wanted all of them to be simultaneously resonant. So that's still the case with a finesse of 130, but at a finesse of 10,000, the experiment would get much harder. Okay, a first thing that we did with that was not holding the atoms at all. We were using the cavity mode just to generate flashes of light like in the standard atom interferometer, but we were using it for a pretty interesting application that I want to dwell on for a minute or two. Um, hot object generate thermal radiation, right? If I have a sphere in the middle and it's hot, it's gonna radiate black body radiation isotropically. Most of that radiation is infrared and therefore red detuned relative to any atomic resonances. So it causes a downward AC Stark shift of the atomic ground state. That's one of the um, nice universal results in quantum mechanics that I like to teach the undergrads. Second order perturbation theory applied to the ground state always gives you a downward shift, right? Okay, that means an atom's energy close to the hot object is lower than far away, and that should generate an attractive force. And indeed it does. Um, so we've put this object close to the atoms, we've heated it from outside with a laser beam, and then you take data as it cools down, and you, on one single data run, it's hard to see that, and the reason why the data is so noisy as, as you heat up this thing, it starts outgassing like crazy and there goes your quantum coherence or at least your population. So the signal to noise in an individual measurement is not very good. But if you repeat it for a while, you see the attractive acceleration and it follows the predicted T to the four dependence for, um, for black body radiation. I like it because this is a micron per second squared effect. In a field where we say we're measuring gravity to the 10 to the minus nine level, nanometers per second squared, routinely. But turns out that if you do so, you have to make sure that the temperature in your vacuum chamber is nice and homogeneous so that these thermal radiation gradients don't spoil your accuracy. Another thing we did with that, yeah. Using a magic wavelength instead. Uh, thermal radiation is broadband, can't do anything there, I think. Well, yeah, that, right, never mind. You could, of course, use an atom that's less susceptible to it, right? You need a very small ground state polarizability, and we're using cesium just for historical reasons. I'm sure there's a hand-picked species where this effect is lower. Um, but should but I mean, I, I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is, in order to see this, you you deliberately heat it up. Yes. So if you if your apparatus is um, is all at the same temperature, then is there any effect? No. The, then there's not. Yeah. So is that that hard to do? No. Um, but this it, is a micron per centimeter squared. I mean, it's per, I mean, micron per second squared. That's a big effect. Right, but it's deliberately made. Yeah. Big. So 
I think at the nanometer per second square level, that means if you keep your temperatures equal to numerically 0.1 Kelvin, but in practice gets better if your apparatus is large, right? Yeah. If everything is large, then gradients are distributed over larger distance scales. So I would say difficulties start appearing at the nanometer per second scale. Um, People have used atom interferometry to verify the Einstein equivalence principle at the 10 to the minus 11 level. And they indeed have installed temperature sensors along their apparatus to make sure they have this effect mapped out. So it's not a huge deal, but I think if you progress beyond even that 10 to minus 11 level, then it'll become, like for atomic clocks, there's a black body shift it's not making atomic clocks useless. It's just one more parameter you need to control. Right? OK, um, other applications. Um, we've used that to probe some of these um, fifth force theories. This is a hypothetical particle known as the chameleon. It has been proposed in the context of um, explaining the accelerated expansion of the universe. And I don't want to go into the details here, but there's a parameter space characterized by um, coupling constant m and a self-coupling constant lambda. People have used all sorts of methods to rule that out. For example, torsion balances, they cut into the parameter space from here. And neutron interf interferometry is up here microspheres, um, levitated microspheres. And our atom interferometry results from 2015 and 17 cut into that parameter space relatively deeply. Um, so those are two applications of this cavity-based atom interferometer before it became a lattice hold interferometer. Now let's... Um, yeah, let me skip that. Let's see, if we now turn on the lattice to hold the atoms, how long can we see fringes? So at very short hold times of about 0.2 seconds, in our setup, we expect an interference contrast of 50% at most, because um, what I haven't shown on the previous drawing, there are atomic states which do not interfere, but are nevertheless detected, and they make up 50% of the population. So in the best case, we expect 50% interference contrast. And at short time scales, we are getting pretty close to that. After one second, we still get close to that. After five seconds, the contrast starts decreasing, but can still be observed up to 20 seconds. And that was something we published in 2019. Of course, I was so impressed by the work of the students at that time because I had thought if we can reach even two seconds, but for sure if we can reach five seconds, this setup has done what everything that I hoped for, right? It has shown that holding atoms rather than dropping them will give you a long coherence time. That they got it up to 20 seconds is really a testament to the experimental skill of the people in the lab. You know, a lab always seems to have this one person who sees a weird trace on an oscilloscope and says, oh my God, it's all wrong before you even know that anything is wrong and knows exactly which knobs to turn in order to improve it. And this has happened here multiple times. Um, the puzzling thing about this is that we had no idea um, what was limiting it at 20 seconds? Why did the contrast stop being observable already at 10 seconds or maybe at 30 seconds? We had no idea. But first, a nice side effect. Um, when we took this interferometer and we were shaking it, we had a voice coil actuator to wiggle it around a little bit. We found that the sensitivity as function of the drive frequency goes down like the blue graph and the black dots are the experimental points. So it fits the theory very well. 
but an equivalent atom interferometer with atoms in free fall would have the same sensitivity at DC. That's what I mean by equivalent. But then a much higher sensitivity at high frequencies. And that's actually a big limitation of these atom interferometers for field applications. Um, why is that? Well, in an atom interferometer, we interact with the environment usually only through three short laser pulses. In the intervening time, the atom is ignorant of how the rest of the setup is shaking around. And as a result, we're, so we have a fast signal that we're sampling at a slow rate. In other words, we get aliasing. And that means high noise frequencies are folded into the baseband, into the low frequency band. And that generates excess noise. So the equivalence principle tells me if I want to measure gravity, I cannot help but measure vibrations also, right? Because accelerated motion, such as vibration, is indistinguishable from gravity. But atom interferometers are usually much more sensitive to vibrations than required by the equivalence principle. In other words, they give you the red curve and not a curve that goes down like 1 over f. The lattice hold interferometer has the atoms interact with the environment almost all the time. And so instead of aliasing the vibration, you average it out. Hence this um, suppression of vibrational noise. Short detour, what can that be good for? The Navy would love to do um, gravity mapping navigation. What that means is you have your inertial navigation unit, you measure acceleration and rotation and integrate it up like this virtual laser pointer does. Um, but if you have a small offset in let's say the acceleration measurement, you integrate the acceleration to get a velocity and integrate the velocity to get a position, those errors pile up quickly and the accuracy of your inertial navigation system suffers. Um, so you need ground truth. And one type of ground truth you can get is measure gravity on your boat and compare it with a map of gravity anomalies. And it has been shown that this can pretty much eliminate the drift of your inertial navigation unit and doesn't even require a lot of accuracy. So the accuracy of um, even a basic atom interferometer is by far good enough for doing that. But the problem is on a boat, you have a lot of vibrations. So people put the atom interferometer on a gyro stabilized platform to eliminate that, but now, instead of having one sensor that's that size, you have a gyro-stabilized platform that's that size. Um, the lattice hold interferometer might not need that, and so can be used favorably in these um, mobile conditions. Um, one thing that's important for that is ships move in all sorts of ways that make you seasick. And if you have an atom interferometer on that ship, that means the laser beam pointing changes all the time, but the atoms are in free fall. If the ship does that, then the atoms launch like that, and then they fall out of the laser beam, and you get no data anymore. You don't get a false measurement. You get no measurement at all. The atoms just don't interact with the laser anymore. The lattice hold interferometer provides transverse confinement. And so we've tilted the optical table a little bit. Um, admittedly, only by 10 milliradian, we would have to do that by 100 milliradian to really make it work on a ship. And um, still measures the projection of gravity onto the tilted axis. So lattice hold interferometer still takes data when you tilt it. And then all you need is a tilt sensor, which is nice and small and commercially available to correct for the projection, and you're ready to take data on your moving platform. OK, but keeping the quantum state alive, um, why 20 seconds? Why not 10? Why not 30? Of course, first, we were insanely happy about 20 seconds, but we soon realized that we don't understand it. 
After some work, we had an empirical scaling. The contrast seems to decay exponentially with whole time with a time constant tau c, which is inversely proportional to the lattice depth. So stronger laser power makes it less coherent. You might have expected that. And larger wave packet separation makes it less coherent also. And that's all we knew for a very long time, okay? The proportionality constant kappa is about 110 in weird units, microns, recoil energies, seconds. So at 100, if we have 110 micron splitting, the lattice has one recoil depth and we have, and then we get one second of coherence decay time. Typically we run the experiment with just a few micron separation so what that shows you is you can either have a large separation and a short hold time or a small separation and a long hold time, right? But where does this come from? It was really a big mystery. And we went through a huge list of things that we thought would be the limit, but that turned out weren't. For example, the first thing we thought is, well, if a cavity helps getting the coherence from one second to 20, then a better cavity should help. So we replaced the cavity mirrors with better ones had no effect. Another thing we thought, well, there has to be some difference between the two places at which the wave packets are localized. And that could come from the Gaussian laser beam going through a focus. So we made sure that the wave packets are symmetrical with respect to that focus, when in the original experiment that wasn't the case. That took months because you need to break vacuum to do that and had exactly zero effect and so on. So I don't want to bore you with this list, but just highlight that this was essentially the entire pandemic and then some of work that is summarized here. And the hero of this table is Chris Pander, my postdoc who was previously at the ACME um, EDM collaboration. Luckily, you tapped on the table, yeah. it didn't take too long. <laughs> right. <laughs> that didn't take too long, but doing it while well, you... Well, well there were, but there was no entry for, for, for uh, instead of no change. So what, what happened there? Where are we? Where are we? Um, right in the middle. <laughs> tapped on table during run. So, yeah, so alignment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to go back for, to for this one, I guess. Um, no, that was the experiment tilt, right? So that was a change by 1.5 milliradian. That was the initial step to the work that I showed earlier, where we tilted even longer. Um, but it didn't influence the contrast, right? But after a while, we found two things that influenced it. One was atom temperature. With hindsight, you will say, well, that's obvious. Cold air is better, right? Um, that wasn't obvious to us at the time. Um, what we found is that this kappa parameter could be tripled by selecting cold air atoms from our sample. And the way we did that is the cavity means that the Gaussian beam waste is fixed to 760 microns. But if I go to a LG20 higher order mode, it looks like this, right? And the central peak is sharper than in the fundamental mode. So effectively, the atom now sees a thinner optical lattice. So if we cool our atomic sample, let it expand for a bit, and then turn on the thin cavity mode, it will trap only the slowest moving atoms. Those are, and so what remains behind has a much narrower thermal distribution. On the other hand, changing the cavity mode might do many other things to the experiment. So we did some control experiment to verify that. For example, first we use the thin cavity mode to select only the slowest moving atoms, but then switch back to the original one and so on. And that convinced us that the coherence decay constant goes up as the sample temperature goes down. So that was a first sign of um, light at the end of the tunnel. Do you have a, a 
thermalization it's a mix to the directions uh, the temperature yeah the um trap potential is sufficiently complicated that the ergodic theorem should apply yeah um but even temperature is a puzzling thing because um Let's say you have your lattice and the atoms have a large thermal velocity, but not so large that they just go out of the trap, right? If the trap potential for the two wave packets here and here is exactly the same, now apply my beam splitter. I have two copies of the same wave packet. They start orbiting around in the trap. But if the initial conditions of that motion are the same and the potential is the same, that should not give rise to a dephasing. So what gives rise to the subtle difference between the two locations that, um, that causes the dephasing and the loss of contrast? And eventually we found that it's tilt noise. Why was that so hard to find? Well, we had convinced ourselves, and I may have convinced you that linear vibrations don't affect the lattice interferometer. We were actually quite proud of that, but it turns out tilt noise of the lattice does. Okay, why is that? Well, if I have tilt noise, then if I have a wave packet here and here, the upper one sees a larger vibration. And so on average, this atom sees a different lattice potential. That alone is not enough to cause the dephasing. Different lattice potential if the atoms are at zero Kelvin doesn't matter. Likewise, atom temperature with exactly the same trapping potential at the two sides doesn't matter either. But the combination of that is it. And that's maybe our excuse why it took us so long to find the reason because it's a combination of two effects. They both have to be present. So the upper and lower interferometer arms see different potentials due to tilt noise. And while we couldn't make the tilt noise lower in our apparatus, we could make it worse and show that at least that's reasonable as an influence. This is the only equation-laden slide. So we made a Monte Carlo model where we propagate 400 atoms through the lattice potential. The lattice potential is mostly Gaussian, but has this um, time-dependent and z-position-dependent wiggle. Um, landau zener tunneling between lattice sites is accounted for. We calculate the time evolution phase by integrating the Lagrangian. Also, when the two wave packets get put together, but they are not exactly overlapped, there's a separation phase, which is just a fancy restated way of de Broglie's matter wave P equals H bar K equation. And then we turn on lattice vibration. And here's a typical result for the contrast as function of time. We see a roughly exponential decay for the first 20 seconds that agrees well with the experiment. But we also see that the contrast levels off at about 5% and stays there. So this is not noise from the simulation. This is a real prediction. If this model is right, there should be some residual contrast at very long times that we were unable to see in the experiment at that time. But now, of course, we wanted to know, is this real? So one observation is that so why is that? It's because after 20 seconds, the fastest moving atoms have taken themselves out of the lattice. They've just fallen away. And only a colder sample is left behind. So it makes sense that the coherence should now decay more slowly. Um, in the model, I can, of course, put in any atom temperature I like. And in the model, I can make the atom temperature so low that the contrast never decreases. Okay. In the experiment, of course, we can't do that. We don't have evaporative cooling, for example. So, so what but, is the temperature in your experiment? Um, it's, so after Sisyphus cooling, we have raman seidman cooling that gets, should get us to 400 nanokelvin, but in practice, it's more like 500 or 600. In the vertical direction, we do a velocity cut, reducing it to 50 or something like that. But transversally, it's still the 4 or 500. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, but now we wanted to see this. And in order to see this, we have to be able to reliably measure about 5% contrast. So we upgraded the experiment. We increased the atom number. We detuned the optical lattice further to reduce single photon scattering. We amplitude stabilized the optical lattice to remove parametric heating. So that's one of the parameters that influence the atom hold time, but not the contrast decay time. We installed a fancy new camera for low noise imaging, reduced laser face noise. And the upshot of all of that was we can now measure fringes at about a bit more than one time the standard quantum limit, less than two times. But most importantly, we can now measure much lower contrasts. So here's the old data that I've just shown you. It goes to 20 seconds. And with the new one, we could go to 30 and 60 and 70. Admittedly, the signal to noise here is small, as expected from the model. But we've run statistical tests confirming that this isn't just fitting noise. This is a real thing. So at a confidence level of about 97%, I think this is real and um, fits the model quite well. So here is the contrast versus hold time. The prediction of the model is this blue band here. The data points are these ones. This is the initial exponential decay. And the dotted, sorry, this inertial navigation unit doesn't work that well. Um, this line is just hypoth hypothetical. If I had only the initial exponential decay plus noise, the noise would still fool me that I will see non-zero contrast at 60 seconds, but it would be much lower than what we actually see. OK, so we believe that this confirms the theoretical expectation that after the initial 20 seconds or so, the contrast kind of levels off and decays with a much slower constant. And it would be overfitting the data if I told you an exact number, but it's an exponential decay of about one minute time constants. For sure, larger than that doesn't make sense to quote the exact number. But, but presumably, it wouldn't continue to be exponential because you're still going to always have this effect of late yeah. times colder and colder. Longer. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, um, according to the noise, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what does this tell us? I think it confirms that we finally have a model of the contrast decay that matches the data even in this unexpected regime. It also shows that you can hold a wave packet for 60 and even 70 seconds and still interfere it, which is by far the longest it would take a kilometer high tower in order to get that in free fall. And also, if we now say, OK, we trust the model, then what if I take the model and plug in zero Kelvin? Then I get a contrast that never really decays. So we want to build a new setup with much better laser cooling. And um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, well, can I use that for anything? Well, the lattice interferometer may have long-term fringes, but the systematic effects are a big can of worm. The um, optical lattice generates a light shift, right? That's how it works. If that light shift has a gradient, it mimics a force. And that would be a huge systematic in measuring gravity. Lattice imperfections may give that force a complicated spatial dependence, right? Making things harder. Um, but we wanted to use it for measurement. We wanted to use it for searching for fifth forces along the lines that I've already shown you. Um, but now taking advantage of the lattice hold. The hold gives us a unique advantage over atoms in free fall. The atoms can be positioned close to the source mass for a very long time and accumulate more and more signal instead of falling away, right? 
Um, so it's a centimeter size tungsten mass. Its gravity is 35 nanometers per second squared at the optimum point. That's three parts per billion of Earth's gravity. So we're looking for a tiny effect here. Um, we improved the setup further, but how do we deal with those systematics? And Chris Panda to the rescue, who was a, has taken a page from the ACME playbook, install switches to modulate your signal, but hopefully don't modulate your systematic effects. For example, moving the atoms from above the source mass to below should invert the wanted signal, but hopefully leaves the systematic effects more or less alone. Also, we are able to move the mass away. That's why it has the slot here. We can move it away without interrupting the optical lattice. That should turn the wanted effect on and off, but not the systematic effect. At the same time, while you're doing that, so we're going through, we're toggling the atom position up and down, up and down, inverting the signal. And every about 10 minutes or so, we toggle the mass from in to out and back, right? So that gives us four combinations, generating four data channels. Only one combination of them, this one, is the wanted signal. But we can still monitor the other three channels to see if we have varying systematic effects. So that gives you a very good tool to suppress systematics in the wanted channel, but um, monitor them in the other channels. So that we've taken data for two months, um, the noise is largely normally distributed. Um, we checked for systematic effects by varying a large number of parameters. And this was taken, this data was taken in a blinded fashion to be sure we're not stopping data taking when the result agrees with Newtonian gravity, right? And we got a statistical uncertainty about five times as good as what we had before with freely falling atoms. Um, here's the systematic error budget. Since I'm running out of time, feel free to ask me about this later, but let's not dwell on this for now. Um, turns out gravity is almost exactly as predicted. Um, the anomaly has an upper limit of 13 nanometers per second square, one part per billion of Earth's gravity, more sensitive than the fountain interferometer before and puts a new limit in this parameter space that I've shown earlier. If I had a new setup with better cooling and an optimized geometry, it would be even better. You can then also look into ruling out fifth forces. So right now we're not. So here's a fifth force parameterized as a Yukawa potential. This is the strength compared to gravity. This is the Yukawa range in meters. Right now, our data doesn't cut into any new parameter space. But if we improve this um, and also improve the geometry, we would be able to get um, new limits on various length scales here. OK, finally, what to do with that? And this is um, one of the exciting things about coming here is I can talk to my collaborators, um, Dan Carney and Jake Taylor, who had the very nice idea to, um, it goes back to Feynman in 57, who essentially asked, if I have a mass that's in a superposition of being here and here, and I measure its gravitational field, which way will it point? Um, if gravity is quantum, then you would expect that the gravitational field is in a superposition. Half the time I measure, it pulls there. Half the time, it pulls there. And making the measurement collapses the superposition, and tells me where the mass is. And that's certainly what you get in four electrostatic fields. But gravity is described by the geometry of space-time. And essentially, we don't know what it means for space-time to be in a superposition. So at least conceptually, there's a problem with that, right? On the other hand, if your point of view is that gravity is classical, then it has to decide which way it wants to point, this way, that way, or maybe in the middle. 
In fact, that's what you usually do when you couple general relativity with quantum mechanics. You couple it to the expectation value of the wave function. So it would point to the middle between the two things. Anyway, um, so kind of can you generate a Young's double slit experiment for a massive object and see which way the particle took by measuring its gravity? That's the question we're asking here. Um, the null hypothesis is that, yes, you can. A mass in a superposition would generate a gravitational field that's in a superposition, and measuring that would collapse my um, quantum state. And that's one of the great ideas that Dan Carney and Jake Taylor have when they're working together. Um, we have to formulate an alternative hypothesis, and I'm not the expert here, but um, if gravity isn't quantum, then what could it be? Well, it could be a lot of things. Here is a Strawman theory. I say Strawman theory because nobody believes it to be an accurate description of nature. But it's the following. Let's say nature tries very hard to fool us into believing that gravity is quantum, even though it's really classical. And how does it do that? It measures the position of my object periodically. And if it finds that the object is here, it would generate a classical gravitational field pointing that way. And then a little later, it measures the mass distribution again. And if it finds that a center of mass is here, generates a new classical potential pointing that way, right? Silly as this theory sounds, it is compatible with experimental observations so far. OK, um, that should tell you how hard it is to really do gravity experiments, not how good this theory is, right? OK. Because nature, in this model, measures um, the position of objects every once in a while, it should generate a lot of noise. It should generate decoherence in quantum systems. Aha. Uh -huh. So here's the experiment they proposed. This is the atom in our atom interferometer, and this is the atom in a superposition of two lattice states. Put a harmonic oscillator close to it, and this harmonic oscillator could be a torsion balance, feels the pull from the atomic state. And depending on what the state is, it will start moving or not moving, right? So let's say I start the atom here, and the oscillator mass is here. Now, if the atom is in a superposition, then this state here will pull the oscillator up. It will now start swinging. Whereas this state here will do nothing. So now my oscillator is in a superposition of being swinging and not swinging. That means part of the information of where the atom is now is in the oscillator. And since information is conserved, that means the contrast of my atomic interference fringes decreases. However, after half a cycle, the oscillator is back into its old position. And now the oscillator does not have the information anymore. It's now back in the atomic system. And the contrast of my interference fringes increases back. So we get a collapse and revival of interference fringes if gravity is quantum. Um, whereas the Strawman theory would just give you the collapse. OK, so the smoking gun in our experiment would be the revival of the interference contrast at the pendulum period, whereas the Strawman theory just gives you the collapse. OK, and this is a collaboration between people here um, and people at Berkeley and Berkeley Labs. Some of them are here. Thank you so much for helping with that and for working together. It is an enormous challenge to do that. Um, I'm not even knowledgeable about all of our experiment. I'm certainly not at all knowledgeable about how to make a good torsion pendulum. And the ultimate goal would even be a torsion pendulum that can be cooled down. 
much below room temperature, maybe even into the quantum ground states, right? We're, talk we're not talking about physics that can be done on a PhD thesis timescale here. We're talking about physics that hopefully will be done before I retire, but maybe not, right? <laughs> But you have to start somewhere. And I'm very grateful also to the Heising Simons Foundation. They know that we won't reach the final goal during um, the period of this grant and they are happy to support it anyway. So here's the setup. Um, this is the lattice interferometer, laser cooling chamber, science chamber. The torsion pendulum is here. There would be a shield against unwanted electrostatic interactions. And this is the modulation invisibility expected with coherent gravity. So it's about 1% times the square root of the temperature of the pendulum, square root of the separation between the wave packets in millimeters, the square of the time tau, and the square root of the atom number. This here is key. Um, if the pendulum has a large classical motion, it enhances the modulation of the fringes. So we get a signal even when the pendulum is non-cooled. The caveat is that in order to really conclusively prove that gravity is quantum by all definitions of that word, you cannot have the pendulum at a high temperature. But for ruling out the Strawman theory, you can, and you get a much stronger signal that way. OK, I have, I'm already over time. So let's say we would like, in three or five years, observe a revival signal in ruling out the Strawman theory, but of course, not giving the ultimate, ultimate proof of quantum gravity. And longer term goal would be constrain less contrived models, for example, entropic gravity. And the moonshot would be really observe the revival caused by vacuum fluctuations of the pendulum. That's the thing where I said this may not happen before we all retire. Anyway, um, have huge thanks to the team. I mentioned Chris Pander, who is really pushed this experiment through the years of the pandemic and through the valley of ignorance to the point where I was starting to feel bad. And I said, Chris, we need to focus on some lower hanging fruit. But he didn't want to know anything about that. And he um, finally found the reason for the decoherence. And I want to thank you a lot for your attention. Very far over. Maybe Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, over. Yeah. yeah. So, on that problem, um, how many amps can you get to get a step for exponential on your one? After one minute, it's down to hundreds, unfortunately. Um, we hope to improve that with better vacuum, better intensity stabilization. We start out with tens of thousands.